There's always something cooking. Ding! Congrats! Woo! You've officially leveled up to Motorcyclist Plus One. That means it's time to go to the local dealership and trade in that common old Garden Ninja 400 R3 for a better motorcycle. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that since you've spent six months cruising around on a 40 horsepower baby bike, that you're ready to take the plunge into the 200 horsepower leader bike life. You're a big boy or girl and you can handle the power. No, you can't. Sorry, you're not going to leave it in D mode. You're not ready for the absolutely mind-shattering speed and acceleration that comes with owning a proper expert-level motorcycle. Yeah, they have rain mode, but let's be real, you're not going to spend your time in rain mode. Also, rain mode just speeds in the seconds. power load down, so you're still able to coax out all the ponies, even in rain mode if you stay on the throttle. So with interest in keeping you baby squids unsplattered for long enough to get on a big bike, let's talk about some appropriate Last second round. motorcycles. There isn't really a displacement limit since 900s make the same power as 600s, but we're going to stay under 125-ish horsepower. Anything more than that, and we're looking at real rocket ships. And don't worry, moving up from a Ninja 400 to a bike making even 100 horsepower is going to feel like a stratospheric leap forward. And while we're on the subject of feeling fast, you've never really going to be truly be able to experience 200 horsepower on the street anyways. Just trust me, if you pick any of these bikes on the list, you're going to be one happy squid. Before we get too far into this one, I feel like I should mention that your bike isn't the only thing you should be upgrading when you're riding up. You need to take a minute to check out your riding gear and your tools. That's right, you don't want to be turning that same old Harbor Freight wrench on a Harbor Freight rear stand for the rest of your riding days. Allow well, me to let you in on a lesson I learned after many stripped screws and broken parts. Quality tools matter. Luckily, we've got you covered over on shop.yemeni.co. We've got Vortex rear stands in stock now that's a solid step up for making do with a car jack or stacks of books you're trying to convince yourself is totally fine. Investing a few bucks in a proper rear Wait. stand and knowing that your bike won't fall on top of Wait. you while you're busy cleaning Ten your seconds. chain is really good. The best part is that every dollar you spend on new gear over at shop.amity.co will get you entered to win a motorcycle from one of our four giveaways. You can actually select the sweepstakes right there when you're selecting your product. And who knows, maybe you'll pick up a rear stand and get a motorcycle to go with it too. Wouldn't that be nice? Now, let's start off strong with two motorcycles that were on our list of the best naked bikes for 2022. Yes, we're talking about two motorcycles at once here, but there's something you'll notice when you're looking at second bikes. There's a lot that occupy the same displacement or power range with similar tech. Let's start off with the orange one, the KTM Duke 890R. This one is a stupid lightweight motorcycle because KTM just kind of wants to make dirt bikes. Tipping the scales at a mere 366 pounds wet and ready to ride with an 889cc parallel twin putting down 121 horsepower and 73 foot-pounds of Torgos. It's got all the tech you'd want and probably more. You can get one for $11,699, but if you're looking at for a motorcycle that seems a little less like an anemic orange space alien, then the Triumph Street Triple RS might be the answer. 765 cc's of spotted dick powered Britishness putting down 121 horsepower and 58 foot pounds of torque. It's not as light as the Duke with the claimed dry weight of 366, so wet and ready to ride, you're looking at about 400 pounds, but it's still going to be plenty fast. You're not paying a bit of the premium for the street triple, but hey, $12,850 is well spent if you ask me. However, if you're not feeling the full Zoot version of either of these bikes, there are cheaper options, including the Duke 790, Ten which is seconds. making a few less ponies is in, isn't as quite race-ready as possible as the other one is, and if you're not ready for all that middleweight power. Don't worry about not getting the biggest and baddest bike if you're not ready for it. Only those who are insecure in their masculinity will give you grief over it. But those two bikes are pushing the limit, coming in right under our 125-ish horsepower threshold for second bike. What about something where you don't have to worry as much? Thankfully, Aprilia has the 200. 660 factory and the RS 660. Now, before someone in the comments section mentions the RS's reliability, seconds. let me head that off at the pass. No, the RS 660 is not unreliable. Yes, there were some catastrophic failures in a few rare cases, but that was down to flawed metallurgy in early engines, and there was a recall, and Aprilia literally replaced entire engines for those who were affected. Those issues have been resolved for the new model year, so I won't let those old reports scare you. The 660 power plant is putting down 100 horsepower and 49 foot-pounds of Torgos, which are perfect numbers for the street, and in both cases, the ergonomics are relaxed enough for daily street use as well. The only question is, is do you want a handlebar or clip-ons? Either way, you're getting a torquey bike with razor-sharp handling, leader bike levels of tech, and cruise control. Aprilia basically created their own niche and populated it with a pretty game-changing motorcycle with the RS660, and now they've thrown the 260 in for good measure. There aren't any pricing details for the 200 factory, but you can pick up an RS for $11,299, and expect the 200 factory to be right there, if not a few hundred dollars cheaper. Last the only round. problem with the 200 or an RS660 is those other naked bikes is that they're actually excellent street bikes, and true squids know that 
the only way to enjoy life is with the motorcycle so uncomfortable that you're basically riding in the fetal position with no torque. That way they can drag me and their suit on the street and set hot laps down their favorite twisty road. I'm joking, obviously. Don't do that. But if you want a super sport experience as your second motorcycle, you want a 600. Except no substitute. The R7 is a fun bike, but it is not a replacement for the tried and true R6. And the RS660 isn't going to be a super sport. The real question is, is are you going to get a Gixxer seconds. 600, an R6, a CBR 600, or a ZX6R? Honestly, it doesn't really matter. Just get the one you think looks coolest. Yeah, the ZX6 is making a bit more torque out of its bigger engine, but if you're committing to the 600 life, torque is clearly not a priority. Let's take a look at the Jixxer 600 since it's been a minute since we made flip-flop jokes on the channel. The Jixxer's packing a 599cc inline 4, putting down 125 horsepower and 49 foot-pounds of torque. Yeah, those are the same numbers as the Street Triple. Surely it'll be just as good of a street Ten bike, seconds. right? Wrong. Stop asking questions. I'll take them all at the end. The Jixxer makes peak power at 13,500 RPM and peak torque at 11,500, meaning you need to Let's keep go. it pinned to feel all the power. Now, while you could theoretically wind out four gears on a 600 on the street without going straight to jail, you'll still be well over 100 miles per hour, so you're not going to be able to really have fun with it. But then you get it out on the track, and all those street woes are instantly going to be forgiven, and then you're going to probably make it into a track bike and just go down that horrible path. But let's be real, you're a Jixxer squid. You're not going to the track. You're just going to go slam the front end down and try to find 186 miles per hour on the freeway. Good luck, my dude. Number four is for the more adventurous sorts out there, people who aren't so enamored with looks and who want to see what's over the next hill. Once again, I've got Ten two seconds. for you to choose from, the Tenere 700 and the Tuareg 660. I'm going to assume that you started on something like a dual sport and learned to ride off-road, and now you want something with longer legs, room for luggage, and mainly a pillion so you can tackle some fun off-road stuff. Well, both of these bikes are going to be a solid step up power-wise with the Tenere putting down 72 horsepower and 50 foot-pounds of Torcos and the Tuareg doing 80 and 51. The main difference between the two of these is the level of technology and the suspension package from a factory. If you want something a bit more bare bones with just you and the bike, I would recommend the Tenere. But good luck finding one for MSRP. These things are going for like 13000 on the uh, second-hand market. But who doesn't like a TFT dash and a whole bunch of gizmos to play with? The Aprilia is also about 35 pounds lighter than the Tenere, so I would bear that in mind if you're looking to do some serious off-roading. Dropping the lighter bike is going to suck marginally less than the big one. Beyond that, the Aprilia is more expensive. Though, again, I have seen some Tenere's going for close to $14,000 because everyone wants one, and Yamaha did not bring enough to share with the class. Still, there are worse fates than Hello. overpaying for a Tenere. You could be on a KLR 650. Number five today is for the Leather Daddies and Pirate Cosplay Enthusiasts, two cruisers that I'm sure we're going to see Spec Sheet Warriors argue about and help reignite an old rivalry about just who's the best on planet Earth. It's the Indian Scout and the Harley Sports Dress. Which one's faster? The Sports Dress. Sorry, Indian, but apparently Harley got sick of being the butt of everyone's joke and made a massive leap forward with the Rev Max 1250cc B twin doing 121 horsepower and 94 foot pounds of torque in the Sports Dress. I have not ridden a Sports Dress yet myself, but Spite tells me the spread of torque is really broad and usable. And while it's got an SV650's rear tire mounted up front, it actually handles pretty well for a cruiser. The only problem with the Sportster is that it's $15,000, which is probably too much money for what it is. In that sense, the Scout still reigns supreme. With its 1133cc V-Twin doing 100 horsepower and 72 foot-pounds of torque, it's a more classic looking bike, which is nice if you're not into the engine and two wheels look of the Sportster S and want Ten something seconds. that looks like it rolled right out of the 60s or 70s. You can pick up a Scout for $11,999 without ABS, but you're really going to want it on this bike. Its brakes are pretty rough and the tires don't like to hold to the ground, which is great for rolling burnouts and not great for the handling. Choose wisely though, choosing Indian or Harley is a lot like choosing Horde or Alliance, but in real life. You will be expected to go to the mat for your brand in online slap flights. It's actually in the purchase agreement. Number six goes to the CBR650R and the CB650R for basically all the same reasons as the RS660. They're both comfortable daily riders that handle well and have that Honda premium build quality and have that lovely inline four soundtrack. The CB is basically just a modern version of the 919 and the CBR is just for people who look like they want to go fast but seconds. don't want the wrist pain. Both are powered by the same 649cc inline four putting down a real-world 82 horsepower and 43 foot-pounds of torque. Yeah, they're the slowest of the quote-unquote street bikes on the list, but they're cheaper than Aprilia's offering, and you don't need crazy levels of tech in your daily rider. They're a solid choice. There are some curious oversights, like a lack of adjustability in the suspension and an LCD dash that you can't read in the sunlight, but at least you won't have to keep answering questions about your bike's reliability. Oh yeah, and it's got an inline-four. Sounds awesome. 
Rounding out the seconds. list is one for people who started on a Royal Enfield 650, a 900cc body, or any other retro style bike, but don't want to throw out their built well gringo and beard wax. If you want to stick with the retro styling, but you want more power, get yourself any of the 1200cc bodies. Triumph makes a whole bunch of them, ranging from the T120 all the way up to the Thruxton RS, putting down 103 horsepower and 85 foot pounds of torque. They've also got the Scrambler line as well, which are really sweet rides. They're all going to have the same sound, just with a bit more bass thanks to the bigger engine, some higher quality parts in the brakes and tech package, and all the hipster cred you could possibly want. Whether you want to hit a trailer or a coffee shop, there's a Bonnie built just for you. Just don't forget the surfboard rack and the optional single tail bag. Those are required for maximum beard wax. Fact. Venetia Burney, who at age 11 suggested the name Pluto for the ninth planet in our solar system, lived to see it demoted to a dwarf planet in 2006. And that's sad. Goodbye. Well, 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 my little squid, you've made it to the end of yet another Yammy Noob video. Thank you so much for watching. Just for you, got a little treat for you right over here. Brand new video for you. You can watch it, check it out. It's probably some squidding, some street riding, maybe some track riding. Maybe I'm binning my Ducati off-road. Who knows what's going on in that video? You should probably click on it and find out. If I won Powerball, I'd get a yacht for our fishing trips. Nice. Have you got your ticket? Mm -hmm. I forgot something. Uh, I think you forgot the guest, too. Well, it's my Ten time. seconds. Welcome to a Weekends with Yam episode. I have Spite with me here today because we are going to be talking about motorcycle trends and predictions for the next 10 years because we think the Scrambler is finally dead. I think they're officially in the cafe. The first thing you need to know about the Honda CB650R is that it's not like other 650cc bikes. It has a four-cylinder engine, which means it sounds like this. Let's go. about racy. In 2019, middleweight naked bikes are one of the few sport bike categories that aren't suffering large sales declines and making marketers scratch their heads wondering what else they can do to spur up sales. Adding five more horsepower to last year's model and some updated fairings just won't cut it anymore like it did in the 90s and mid-2000s before the financial crisis of 2008 when the sport bike market basically collapsed onto itself. The CB650R is a salve at a time when parallel twin engines dominate both the small displacement starter bikes and the vaunted 650cc naked class. It's a bike that conforms to the past, yet snubs its nose at the current crop of nakeds and says Yamaha's MT-07 is immature, the SV650 is long in the tooth, and the Ninja 650? That's just plain old boring. Strangely enough, the CB650R is actually much more of a traditionalist than it is some new punk rebel in the category. Younger viewers might not know it, but a generation ago, you could pick a middleweight 600cc inline 4 motorcycle from any of the big four that was comfortable, affordable, and looked cool. Bikes like the Yamaha FC6, the Honda CBR600F4i, dubbed the Hurricane. Man, I miss those 90s naming conventions. Yeah, the Fireblaze, the Hurricanes, we should bring that back. And the Ninja 600R. These all had a few things in common. Comfortable ergonomics, a slightly detuned inline four-cylinder engine from their racy brothers, and reliable Japanese build quality that afforded you a bike that could take you to work and back, and would happily do a track day or two, maybe even a long-haul trip. These flexible do-anything bikes fell out of favor while the sport bike market really heated up in the late 90s and early 2000s. We are seeing a resurgence in the jack-of-all-trades motorcycle these days, as consumers who are financially challenged, let's say, can't afford a three-bike stable and need a bike that they can tour with, commute with, seconds. and chuck down a track every once in a while. The CB650R is a modern interpretation of these bygone inline four-cylinder Swiss Army Knife bikes, and in this naked configuration with its neo-retro cafe looks, as Honda points out, it looks stunning and fits with the current zeitgeist of retro-looking motorcycles that have a modern flair. If you want the true torch holder of this class, Honda will happily sell you a CBR650R. It's a fully fared, mildly detuned inline four-cylinder 650cc front of a bike. Truly a dying breed. So 
Why do I have a CB650R and what makes me qualified to discuss it? Well, I own one as part of our beginner bike giveaway series, links down below, where I ride, own, and modify these bikes for a while before ultimately giving them away to a lucky person. So I've gotten the chance to ride and own the CB650R for about two months and have put about 500 miles on it. Now I don't know all the ins and outs of the bike, but I've spent enough seat time with it that I feel Last confident round. in my ability to review it. So, as everyone is wont to ask, what are the specs? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's run through some of the most important numbers. The Honda CB650R will set you back 9,199 American dollars before tax, title, and licensing fees. Unless you are a shrewd negotiator or can locate one that's sitting on a dealership floor, this is a five-figure motorcycle. Tough to swallow in a market where second-hand MT-07s can be had for 5,000 smackaroos as I purchased one earlier this year as part of that same giveaway series. The Honda CB650R is propelled seconds. through time and space by a 649cc inline four-cylinder engine, making a healthy 94 horsepower and 47 foot-pounds of torque. Make no mistake, while this motorcycle well competes with the likes of Suzuki's SV650 and Yamaha's MT-07, it feels much, much quicker than both of those bikes in power delivery and top-end performance. The CB650 is a serious bike, and should you find yourself with a throttle hand that hasn't seen many miles, it could spit you right off. A bright spot for me on these motorcycles are the true sport bike class front brake calipers provided by Nissan. These brakes feel, perform, and look much better than anything else in the class. It's dual discs up front. The CB650R has a non-adjustable front end provided by Showa. It's damped rather stiff from the factory, suggesting that Honda has a mind for people to take these on their favorite twisty back road or even a track day without too much hassle. The only adjustability you get is preload at the rear. I would have liked to see fully adjustable suspension on this motorcycle. However, that would have certainly driven the MSRP beyond the four-figure gate and would have it competing with some other bikes that it may not have any right competing with. The Honda wears the sport bike standard tire size at 120-70-17s in the front and 180-55-17s in the rear. Now the stock tires it comes with are incredibly touring bias with a weak front end flickability. Should you own one of these, my recommendation is to invest in some higher seconds. quality rubber that won't last as long but suits the character of the motorcycle much better. A Dunlop Q3 Plus comes to mind or a Bridgestone S22. The seat height is 31.9 inches, round. making it approachable for most riders, but a few inches taller than other bikes in the class. It's shorter than a street triple, but taller than an SB650. So, how does it ride? The CB650R carries with it the famous cold corporate Honda badge, the card-carrying ID that lets the world know we're on two wheels, but we'll be damned if we're going to have fun or be loud and obnoxious about it. The whole experience feels very serious, especially when you turn it on and you hear the low drone of that ultra-smooth inline four-cylinder engine purring away. I find it especially smooth if you fitted a full exhaust system like we have with ours. You pull away and it feels every Ten bit seconds. like a $10,000 motorcycle. It's exceptionally well built, and when compared to Suzuki or Yamaha's offerings in the segment, it makes those motorcycles feel like plastic shed built project bikes. But something strange happens as you ride the CB650R. The seriousness of the experience, the corporate Honda feel, all that starts to dissipate as you spend more time with it and you realize why we had those inline four cylinder comfortable motorcycles in the 90s in the first place. This is a configuration that's difficult to argue with, and it gives you an extremely rewarding riding experience Ten if seconds. you're not trying to push 10 tenths on your favorite back road or track. At a comfortable 5 tenths or 6 tenths pace, the CB650 is a great ride. My first day of riding with the CB650 gave me the sensation I haven't had with many motorcycles this year. I simply did not want to get off the thing. I just wanted to keep riding it, feeling the smoothness of the power delivery, and enjoying a great package. But that doesn't mean there's only praise to be heaped on for the CB650R. The CB is quick to remind you that although the soundtrack emanating from your exhaust pipe is 100% sport bike, the power delivery is not. There is a noticeable and significant dip in power between 5 and 7,000 RPM that feels so artificial and numb. It's as if you're rolling on the throttle with power and you roll off 40% and then roll back on, all while you're at wide open throttle. So those of us who are familiar with more race-oriented machines, I'm a proud yet bashful 675R devotee myself, the CB650R quickly reminds you that there is no top-end rush. There's only smooth, linear, and controlled power output from this engine, no more and no less. To give you perspective, the CB makes 94 horsepower at 12,000 RPM from the 649cc mill. My Daytona with its 675cc triple makes 128 horsepower at 14,400 RPM. It's the same story with Honda's very own CBR600RR, 120 horsepower at 13,500. As sport bike enthusiasts, despite all the fancy rev counters, gear position indicators, tachometers, we shift and feel with our ears and our throttle hand. 
The 6.9cc gives you a fun rush, but it's seconds. not quite the rush you'd expect. The CB feels like a board of directors at a startup, and your right wrist is the entrepreneur, full of gumption. They tell you to mind your expectations, manage yourself, and steer the ship in a calm and steady direction, when all you want to do is wring the bike's neck and have some fun. However, in the interest of fairness and because he has been contributing to the channel and has spent some seat time on the bike as well, I thought it'd be cool to open up the floor to Spite and have him weigh in on how he feels with the bike. Alright guys, Spite here. Yim gave me five to eight hundred words to give you my thoughts on the CB. So for the sake of brevity, let me first say that I really do like the bike. I think that Let's the neo retro styling suits the tone Honda's trying to achieve. Have you guys seen this gas tank? It's friggin' gorgeous when the sun hits it. But now let me qualify that a little. I can't help but see what this bike was in years past. For those of you in the comments who are getting ready to tell me that the CB650R and the CB900F have nothing in common, shh, I'm sorry, but you're just wrong. Every time I sit on the CB650R, I look down and I wish I was on my 919. Makes me long for that lopey idol of the 90s seconds. inline 4. I miss the analog gauges that tell me only what I needed to know. And I miss the imperfections of a bike built on a budget with what was left over on the factory floor. Last I've mentioned round. it before, but my problem with Honda as a manufacturer is that the bikes they make are flawless, which unfortunately makes them less fun to own and work on than a bike that perhaps wasn't so rigorously engineered. And I say that as the owner of a Honda Interceptor. Their bikes just feel less playful, less sassy, or even less yours, if you know what I mean. Sure, you might throw an exhaust on your bike, some different bars, maybe bar ends or a tail tie, but at the end of the day, it's still going to look more or less the same as it did when it rolled off the dealership. Ten seconds. But those are the musings of a guy who, for the better part of 2018, spent every weekend ripping apart a 919, changing something, fixing this issue, replacing that part. For someone who perhaps doesn't want to engage with that aspect of owning a motorcycle, this bike would be perfect. A couple of aesthetic mods here and there, and it's done. Ready for you to tear up a twisty road on one of the few inline four-cylinder nakeds that isn't some sort of insane superbike. The ergos are comfy for a 230-pound, six-foot-three guy to sit on the bike for literally hours. The inline four is so buttery smooth that even keeping the bike pinned at redline for an afternoon wouldn't have your hands numb. Not that we've done that as much fun as it might be. The mirrors don't vibrate, the pegs feel good underfoot, and the exhaust, while loud, isn't overbearing. Hell, even the dash, which isn't a TFT display, by the way, looks great in the sun or the shade. The bike oozes the kind of class that other Nakens in this segment just don't. There are all these rowdy, pokey, silly things that you might get as your first or second bike, beat the snot out of them, and then sell them on Craigslist in a year or two. But not the Honda. It has the character Ten of a seconds. forever bike. Would I own one? Yes. Would I buy one? No. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go put on My Immortal by Evanescence and weep quietly Last over round. pictures of my old 919. Thank you, Spite, for chiming in with those thoughts. Honda's CB650R is a wonderful motorcycle, and if you get one, you just need to understand that it's not going to rip your arms off with top-end power, but it will provide you with one hell of a pull-together riding experience that can only come from a manufacturer that's been making CB bikes since the 70s. So, thanks again for watching this video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the CB650R. I think it's a stunning-looking bike, and have thoroughly enjoyed having it in the stable, and will be sad when it heads off to its new owner in March. But... There's always more bikes. Thanks for tuning in. Ten I'll catch seconds. you in the next one. See you later.